Okay, so I'm, I'm Smith Elger. I'm a part-time research professor at UVM. Um, I run the B Lab, which I'm going to be telling you about. Um, and I also work as a, as a consultant for a company called VHV, where um, we, uh, we work with engineers, scientists. Um, some of our biggest clients are DOTs, and I'm actually a, a pollinator specialist, and environmental scientist there. So I get to work on projects related to like pollinator solar, so increasing um, habitat for bees underneath uh, solar panels. Um, and I'm currently working with the DOT to, on some uh, pollinator friendly seed mixes that hopefully they're gonna be um, putting out in 2021. So maybe hopefully looking for more wildflowers along the roadways as you drive down the highways. Um, that's some of the things that I'm working on there. Um, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the Vermont Bee Lab. Um, so Peggy asked that I, that I tell you about the lab and what we've been up to. Um, and uh, I'm gonna do now. So um, I'm gonna first talk to you about how the Bee Lab began, what was some of the research and ideas that were happening um, prior to the, the start of the Bee Lab, which started towards the end of 2019. Um, so we've had sort of a, a full year, but most of it was in 2020, which got a little crazy as you all know. Um, but we'll talk about what, what led to the Bee Lab beginning. And then I'm gonna tell you about the lab, our diagnostic services, which I hope that you'll all take advantage of in this coming uh, season. Um, some of the research projects we're working on, and then um, the education and outreach, which I've been really excited about. I'll tell you about what's going on with that. So when I first started at UVM as a grad student, I was um, very interested in um, diseases and viruses, and um, especially the ones that were being found in wild pollinators, so bees outside of honeybees, so bumblebees in particular. And when I first started, I read this paper. Um, there's a lot of words on, on that slide, but it ultimately says that these viruses were, um, are, were, that were thought to be specific to honeybees are found also in wild pollinators. Um, so these viruses, which you all know, probably a deformed wing virus, you know, with one of them being the one that's transmitted by varroa mites, for example. But so we know that a lot of these viruses get transmitted uh, to honeybees through the varroa mite, but the varroa mites don't host on bumblebees or other bee species. So the question was, well, how exactly are these viruses getting around? Um, what's the way that they're, they're moving between different bee species? Are they coming from bumblebees to honeybees or vice versa? Um, and so I did a study that, that looked at that. And maybe some of you have heard me talk about this before. So this is like five years of my PhD dissertation boiled down to one slide. <laughs> um, so there's a lot that went into this, but ultimately um, this is kind of the gist of it is that um, we wanted to see if bumblebees were more likely to be sick when they were found near honeybee apiaries. And so I sampled um, bumblebees and flowers um, because I thought maybe these viruses could be spreading between bees through flowers. Um, I, I sampled bumblebees and flowers at a number of sites across Vermont, from sites where there was an apiary, and then sites where there was no apiary present. And what ultimately what I found was that bumblebees were more likely to be infected with these viruses when they were living near honeybees. And also that the flowers that I collected, I did find viruses, I found honeybee viruses on flowers, which was really interesting and unexpected, but only the flowers that were collected near honeybee apiaries had viruses on them. None of the honey, none of the flowers outside of the apiaries, I, I didn't find viruses on any of those. And so this led to this evidence for the spillover of viruses from managed honeybees into wild bees and got me thinking, well, this is a big problem. I'm a beekeeper, I, you know, I'm teaching beekeeping, I'm encouraging others to become beekeepers, um, but you know, it could be causing this problem for the natural environment. And so you know, how do I reconcile all this? And what it came to is we need to find ways to make our honeybees healthier, which is better for beekeepers, of course, in the industry, but also because it could lessen or reduce the chance of over to wild pollinators. Um, and so 
keep that in mind. That was sort of one of the things that I've been thinking about for the past, you know, five, six years that sort of led to the diagnostic clinic, which I'll be telling you about in a little bit. Um, another thing that happened was that we conducted this survey in Vermont um, in 2017. And I asked, one of the questions was what, to beekeepers, what's the, the biggest challenge for you as a beekeeper here in Vermont? And this was, um, you know, we got in some cases pages of responses from beekeepers. Um, and so we created this word cloud. And if you're not familiar with how to view word clouds, it's just the, the larger the word is depicted, the more often or more frequent the word was mentioned. And so a lot of beekeepers said, of course, mites and varroa and, excuse me, and overwintering, these were some of the biggest issues or challenges that they dealt with, which we all know um, and understand. But also there was a lot, and I know it might be hard for you to see, but around the edges, it's smaller. There's words like um, mentoring and knowledge and education and inexperience. And this was clearly something that, that beekeepers struggled with. The video feed. Mm -hmm. um, there's something that beekeepers struggled with uh, is that finding ways to learn things about beekeeping or finding a mentor. Um, so this, you know, was another kind of building block towards the bee lab is understanding or trying to figure out ways to get resources and information um, out to beekeepers to help them with this uh, struggle that everyone had mentioned. Um, something else that came out of this survey, which I, I love to, to tell people about, is we asked beekeepers, um, do you monitor your mites? We also asked what method you use, a sticky board or an alcohol wash or a sugar shaker or any of those things. But ultimately, like, do you use any method to monitor your own mites? Um, what do you think the percentage of beekeepers were who basically said that they, that they monitored their mites? Hope it's in the 90s. <laughs> I hope, yeah, you hope it's in the 90s. Anyone else? Oh, I bet, I bet it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would think that a lot more beekeepers would say that they did it, right? Than they actually, than, you know, say, oh, yeah, yeah, I monitor my mites, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but what we found was that 65% of beekeepers actually ad admitted that like they're not doing anything. They're not monitoring and they're not counting, um, which was a lot higher than we thought. So only 34% of beekeepers said, yes, I'm counting mites. Um, so this was another interesting thing. Like how do we get beekeepers to do more monitoring of mites? Because we know that they're a problem. Um, so we found this correlation of loss and with mite treatment so 23% of Vermont beekeepers said that they don't use any treatments at all in their hives. Um, and we found that beekeepers who use miticides have significantly fewer losses. And these are, these are, this is stuff that, you know, seems pretty obvious. Like if you're treating for mites, you're reducing your mite count, your, your bees are going to be doing better. But these are results directly from you guys, from Vermont beekeepers, which was really interesting. Um, and this was another really interesting outcome of that work was colony losses across the state. Um, so this is colony loss by county. And you can see the higher losses are those reddish orange colors, it's kind of like a heat map and the gr darker the green, the lower the losses. Um, and so we found this really interesting pattern with higher losses, losses up in the Northeast Kingdom as high as 53% of, of colony losses. Um, and I know some of you might say, oh, well, all of the, you know, the really experienced or commercial beekeepers are in the Champlain Valleys. So that probably affects us. Well, even if you were to take out um, all of those commercial beekeepers out of the data set, the pattern still holds. Um, and so this was another interesting thing that like, we need more research to understand these patterns across our little state of Vermont. Um, and then we're looking at colony losses, um, you know, if you're, if you're interested in this, um, in this particular year, 35% wintering loss, um, broken out by beekeeper type here on the bottom. Um, hobbyists, <laughs> sideliners, and commercial beekeepers, we sort of categorize them based on how many number of apiaries, which, you know, may or, you know, you might dispute that or not. <laughs> but there was no statistical significant difference between those groups. There's a little, you know, 8% difference between them, like 38 to 30, but um, it wasn't that significant. Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> Working from home, this happens, right? Everyone knows about this. <laughs> okay. Um, 
so another thing that we started to do in 2015 was the National Honeybee Survey. And um, this is a project where some of you might have been involved with it in the past, where we go out and we sample 24 apiaries across the state to get an idea for the level of disease and pathogens um, and also pesticide um, exposure that these bees are exposed to. Um, and we've been doing this since 2015. So this is uh, gonna be our, I guess our sixth year of the study. And we now have this really great, for the first time, like the standard long, standardized longitudinal data set, meaning it's taken course over many years um, on what our state looks like and how it compares to other states across um, our country. And you can all access these data on Be Informed Partnership. You can click on the state of Vermont. You can click on other states, you know, we compare across the nation um, and see how it looks over, over time. Um, so here's, you know, varroa loads over time, virus, we get virus load data. Um, and so this study was like a really good first start to, to collecting data about our Vermont beekeepers in a very standardized way. Um, but it only represents a very small portion of our state's beekeepers. There's only 24 apiaries that we visit and it's limited to beekeepers who have apiaries with at least 10 or more hives. And so we're missing out on some of those smaller, you know, hobbyist beekeepers who might have a couple hives in their yards. We don't know what, what the disease loads look in their hives. So that was another thing that added, like we need a way to get these kinds of standardized data from, from our beekeepers to learn about what's going on. Um, so now um, with all of that, you know, the idea of like, we need education, we need um, more research on some of these really interesting topics. We need to try to reduce spillover of pathogens to wild bees, um, all these kinds of things. Like this led to the, the formation of the Vermont Bee Lab. And we were able to get um, a specialty crop lot grant from the, the agency of ag. And um, the lab looks, well, in 2019, it looked like this. Some of the students have graduated and we've had more students join and we haven't been able to get together for a group picture. <laughs> but um, it consists of undergrad students and graduate students. Um, many have all different backgrounds. Um, some of, we actually have like a marketing and business student who help runs our, um, our social media page um, and people who've been working in our lab for years as lab technicians. Um, so, a really great diverse group to help us out and to keep to start things off um, in towards the end of 2019 and into 2020. So we have this website here, vermontbeelab.com, that is slowly building as we get more and more uh, projects moving on this. Um, so I encourage you all to check it out. Um, and the first thing I'm going to tell you about it are the diagnostic services that we offer. And this is hopefully something that you all will participate in in 2020. Um, and I had mentioned to Peggy, it'd be great to find ways that we can collaborate with each other um, to get this, um, to ease the process of getting samples from you guys all the way up um, from Burlington. So this was, um, this is fun. This is a project that's funded by, um, again, the specialty crop lot grant and has also matching funds from, from BBA. Um, so we are housed in uh, plant and soil science in the Jeffords building, room 220. And this is um, Lily, our, our lab tech who uh, runs all the sample, ran all the samples in 2020 and she'll be working with us in 2021. So that's who will be handling your bees in the lab. Um, and the idea is this, you send us a sample of bees, we process them and we tell you no, your Nozema accounts and your Varroa accounts. And then the plan was to do AFB and EFB for the Vermont Agency of Ag. That's been put on the back burner, at least for 2020, because of a number of reasons, including COVID. <laughs> um, and then we send you a report about what that looks like and what your results mean and how to interpret that. And what does this mean for treatment methods? Um, now, I know a lot of you are thinking, I can do my own damn Varroa accounts. Like, I don't need you to tell me. I can do an alcohol wash. I don't need to send a sample all the way up to Burlington to do Varroa accounts. And yes, that's true. And we hope that this whole going through this process will encourage that Varroa my account. Um, on the other hand, we've heard from beekeepers saying that they're difficult. They have difficulty in seeing the mites, maybe. But we have a very young person in the lab who, <laughs> who has uh, very good eyesight and has no trouble counting mites at all. Um, but then also, this is a very standardized way of doing it. And so if you do it the same way every time and you have us do it and help us count your mites, um, one, it's standardized. You know it's going to happen the same way every time. So you can compare your results with every time that you send it in. Um, you get a nice report. 
and also that you're contributing to this larger project of, of, of us being able to collect data about beekeepers and your mite loads over time. Um, second, or also thirdly, or I've, I've lost count of all the benefits, <laughs> but also um, you are, uh, you know, registered beekeepers are required to submit Varroa management plans. And so you can use our lab as part of your Varroa management plan going forward. You know that you're gonna submit a sample once a month um, to help you make decisions about Varroa. Nozema, um, you know, you need a, mi a microscope and specialized equipment to do Nozema counts. Um, getting Nozema counts, as you all know, Nozema spikes earlier in, early in the spring um, and early summer, and then it sort of goes down over time. So getting your Nozema count early on in 2021 may help you to understand what patterns you might see with your colony's health over time. And so if you get a really high Nozema count early in April or March, you could maybe send another sample in a couple months later and see how that progresses over time and whether you might actually need to requeen or not, um, or do something to intervene if those Nozema loads don't go down. Usually they do with a good nectar flow, right? But these are some things or some information that you can, you know, ways that you can use the information from our lab that we could be, be um, giving you. Um, so real quickly, I'm going to walk you through how to, um, how to access some of the data about the diagnostic lab. Um, you can click on that tab there and um, you can see there's a white circle that you'll see the if, if I was standing in the room, I'd be able to point at the screen, but I can't. So I'm using this white circle to direct your attention. Um, and click on instructions. And um, there is a, it'll bring you to a YouTube video on exactly how to collect a sample. There's also written instructions that you can bring with, your, with you out into the, to the, um, to the field. It's real simple. It's just like an alcohol wash if you've ever done one of those before. And um, to submit a sample, you can click on submit a sample. And there's two methods. You can either print a PDF and take that out into the field and fill it in yourself, or you can submit online. If you um, click print a PDF, you'll get this. You'll print that out. You can write right on it. Um, your apiary name, where it's located. You'll assign an ID to your hive. All this information is filled out in the instructions pretty, pretty clearly. Um, or you could submit online. And there's an online submission form where you fill in all this information online. And then how do you get your bees to us? Well, I think this is gonna be a, this is kind of a barrier, especially for people down in Bennington County. And this is where I hope to maybe work with the club and figure out ways of getting maybe, um, you know, someone acting like a volunteer acting as a hub and getting a batch of samples up to us would be, would be really helpful. But um, ultimately the samples come to our lab and they get dropped off in this drop box um, or we could, you know, meet you halfway. <laughs> we have a lot of people working with us. Um, and the Dropbox is a couple of um, eight frame medium highs that I don't use anymore because I don't run eight frames anymore um, that are uh, nailed together. Um, and you just take open the top, drop in your sample, and then there's clean um, sample containers that you can take one with you or a couple with you if you, if you need some more containers. Um, you don't need to use the containers that we give you, but it would save you, you know, from needing to clean out your peanut butter jar or whatever you might want to send over to us. Um, and this is located outside the fence of the UVM horticultural farm. Um, and what you'll get back is this um, report giving you your varroa loads, standardized 100, you know, how many mites per 100 bees, your nosema load count, how many spores per bee for each of the hives that you've submitted a sample to. Um, we're not doing like averages across your apiary, you're getting it per every, for every one of your hives. And then you also get a sheet about how to interpret your results, what this means about thresholds, when do you, know, when do you need to treat, um, depending on what time of year it is based on these results. So, um, update. So this is from, this is what happened in 2020. Our lab, we, due to COVID shutdowns, we couldn't open until um, mid-July. So we got a real late start. Um, we distributed early on before, um, you know, when we could meet at the, at the VBA meetings, we distributed about 400 of these sample containers out to folks. Um, we didn't get many back, <laughs> um, but we did get 51 samples that we, from representing 13 apiaries. So we were processing only about 16 samples a month and we can do a lot more than that. Um, and we'd love to get a lot more than that so we can sort of build our data set and see what this looks like over time. Um, for the results, we had 
Uh, let's see, 34 samples that were below the treatment threshold that came in that was great. Seven samples actually had no mites. Um, and we had a sample that had a really high mite count, a uh, maximum of 25. So um, interesting stuff there. Average, average um, about four mites per 100 bees. And as you might know, the threshold is about three mites per 100 bee um, is when you need to treat, depending on the season or the time of year. Uh, for nosema, we had very few samples that had nosema, which is not a surprise because we started so late in the season. And as I mentioned, nosema is more of a problem earlier on, right? Um, only four samples were positive for nosema. So it'll be really interesting in 2021 if we can get a, a good number of samples early on to see how this, how this looks. So our aims for 2021 with the diagnostic lab are to increase participation and try to partner with the beekeeping clubs to make sample submission easier and more streamlined so it's not every individual beekeeper having to bring their own sample in. Um, we also accept samples by mail, if that's, that's also a possibility and instructions for that are on our website as well. Um, we also plan to, to publish summary statistics on our website as we collect more data. Beekeepers will always remain anonymous. Um, and we're going to be sending out, similar to the survey that I told you about at the beginning of, of this talk, um, we're sending out another survey with VBA this time. Um, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later about colony losses. And, um, you know, we're going to reassess our objectives and our goals based on the results of that survey. So hopefully all of you will get that and fill that in and send it back. Um, and then we're also going to make a big push to increase the resources we have available to beekeepers on our website. Our first year was about trying to get the, the sample pipeline figured out, the diagnostics lab figured out. We've done that, we're ready. Now we've got to start um, working on some of these other things. Okay, so research going on. So that's about the diagnostic lab, moving on to research projects that we have. Okay, so um, we talked about um, the National Honeybee Survey, the, the beekeeper survey that we sent out in 2017. Um, there's been a number of other projects, which I'm not gonna talk about. I'll talk about um, stuff. But um, you know, if you're interested in any things, you can find, you, you know, you can, if you have a piece of paper, you can write down the, um, you know, the, the, um, the citation here, Burnham and All 17, or you can contact me and I'd be happy to send you the paper and the results on that. Or you can find information on our website about any of these studies. Um, you know, we did a study looking at the um, local versus imported queens and the colonies, like how um, more productive bees, or we found that local bees were more productive and they had lower disease loads. We did a study on migratory uh, beekeeping and found that bees that came back from their, from almonds after their migratory journey, journey in some cases had higher virus loads than, um, than the bees that stayed stationary. So those are some of the things that we were working on. The two new projects we have that we're just getting started with, um, but I'll tell you about, because that way you can follow it <laughs> as we get our results, are um, an adulteration honey study, um, trying to improve markets in Vermont. And then secondly, um, the Northeast Breeding Program. And, and so we're gonna start with the honey adulteration study. So um, honey adulteration in Vermont. So this is a, a project that we're working on with the VBA and um, the Agency of Agriculture. And so in case you, you don't know, uh, food adulteration, here's a definition for you. It's, the intention, it's intentionally decreasing the quality of food by, by adding or swapping out low quality materials or eliminating various important ingredients. Um, and so honey gets adulterated with things like corn syrup or beet syrup or cane syrup or palm sugar or rice syrup um, because it's inexpensive and um, it's a way to bring down the cost of honey and sell a lot of it, right? Because consumers like to pay very little for their products. Um, and so it's a problem because it drives down the price of honey on the, on the market, on the global market. And then that reduced price um, is a problem for beekeepers because beekeepers can't get real, can't get the money that they deserve for their real honey. Um, and so we see this is uh, becoming more and more increasingly uh, an issue. Um, how prevalent is it? Well, it's sort of, there's lots of numbers flying around. Um, I think probably one of the most 
uh, reputable is a study done in 2018, but actually looked at Australia that found that 27% of honey in Australia had questionable authenticity. Um, there is a honey authenticity project that suspected 30% of honey in the world is adulterated. And then I've seen numbers as high estimates as high as 70% of honey in the US is adulterated. So it really runs this really um, wide range, but it's clearly an issue. Even if 27% of the honey is, is, is adulterated, that's, that's a problem, right? So this big question was like, okay, so what does it look like for Vermont? And we don't know, um, but that's what the study is setting out to do. And so we're gonna collect, or we're in the, doing it right now. This is a picture is actually the lap of one of my research assistants. She's in her car and she had just picked up a bunch of honey and she was she she texted me this photo saying is this what you mean by local and not local <laughs> so she just sent that to me I think a couple days ago um so we're collecting a, a total of 30 samples 10 of them are going to be what we consider to be non-local or imported um Andrew Munkris calls it squeezy bear honey so you think of we look at honey you guys are all beekeepers you know you see honey on a shelf and you're like Phew that's not real. Like that looks like molasses. So it's the honey that we sort of suspect. Maybe it's not local, but it's, it, you know, it's a suspect. Um, 10 samples of what we consider to be local honey uh, that says, you know, this is from Vermont. And then we're also very interestingly, we've decided to also collect 10 samples directly from beekeepers. Um, and so let me explain. So beekeepers, who also sell home, who also might sell honey at grocery store shelves. And the reason for, and the beekeepers all know that we're conducting the study and that's the important part because there's a certain amount of adulteration that might be happening unintentionally or mishandling that's happening unintentionally. It might not all be nefarious. Um, and so let me give you an example here. Um, you, you know, most people, they might, they might feed their bees in the spring or, or in the fall, right? And let's say you put some, um, syrup on your bees in the spring to get them through. The bees distribute that syrup throughout the hive. They might move the honey around. Um, you, you know, you then put supers on what you think is going to be nectar. Maybe some of that syrup ends up because the bees will move stuff around. It might end up in those supers. You extract, you think you have authentic pure honey, but there might be a little bit of sugar syrup in there that the bees have, you know, moved around and it ends up in your, in your supers. Um, and so there's really nothing you can do about that. Um, in that case, and it's clearly um, unintentional. And so we need to know the amount of unintentional um, adulteration or that what that threshold might be, because this could be important for setting up um, uh, standards in the future, because we can't make that standard so impossibly low um, that the local beekeepers who are trying to do it right are just being you know, thwarted by the bees who are doing their thing <laughs> um, and the need to feed a little bit in the spring. So um, what are we gonna do with these results? Oh, and so let me just bring that full circle. So collecting the samples directly from the beekeepers, the beekeepers know we're doing, we're doing the study. And the assumption is, is that if the beekeepers knew that it was adulterated, they wouldn't be submitting it for the study. And so anything that we might find in those beekeeper samples, we're gonna assume that it's unintentional and it's- uh, Adulterated honey. So what are the results going to do? They're going to tell us about the prevalence of adulterated mishandled honey for these three different honey types, right? The imported honey, what we consider to be local, and then um, the unintentional mishandling that just might occur. And it's going to, in the future, help um, legislators or, and or the agency of ag determine, like one, how big of an issue is this in Vermont? Is this even a problem? Um, and two, like, uh, what, how are we going to define local or authentic honey in Vermont? And can this be enforced? Or at least could it just be um, offered as like a certification program, something that VBA was thinking about doing, where if you're willing to get your honey tested once a year or whatever, um, by the certification program, you can get your little stamp of Vermont authentic honey, which would then, uh, you know, if con through consumer education, consumers would understand that that's, you know, that's how you know you have authentic honey. Um, similar to, you know, what the maple industry has done here in Vermont, you know, you have authentic maple, Vermont maple syrup. We don't have any like anything like that for, Vermont, uh, for honey currently. So that's what this is all leading to is something, something like that, which is pretty exciting. 
Okay, so the other project I'm going to tell you about that we're that we're getting going here in 2021 um, is through a, a SARE uh, Farmer Partnership Grant with French Hill Apiaries. So you all know, or you should know, Mike Palmer um, and Adam Collins. There's a picture of him down there too. Um, Adam has he's a beekeeper. His own, he has his own operation, but he also is an employee of of Mike Palmer's. And so we got together and wrote this grant proposal to um, sort of leverage the capabilities of the Vermont Bee Lab to help Mike and his operation improve the breeding stock that he's been working on for 40 plus years. Um, and to, so then to, to I guess to make um, Northeast bees more available, better and, and more available to, um, to beekeepers, local beekeepers. Um, and so through, um, through Mike's process of selecting, you know, he, he raises queens, he makes nukes, and he selects for, um, for healthy bees, right? Locally, locally um, adapted bees. And he selects for things like overwintering success, brood production, honey production, and of course, like it's all locally adapted to our Vermont environment, which is such an incredible resource for us to have this, um, this operation here in Vermont. Um, and so what we're looking to do is use the Vermont Bee Lab to support French Hill Apiaries to help him also select for bees that are going to be resistant to or, or tolerant to uh, Varroa, Nozema viruses. And then we're also going to do some level of hygienic behavior testing. We're still working out the details over the winter, um, over this winter for how that's going to look. Um, but it's going to be a three-year study. And the first year we're going to test, a, well, we're going to test 100 colonies each year. And basically, um, based on all of these different factors, the ones that Mike is already using, and then the nozema and viruses and things that we're going to test for, we're going to select the best, the winners. <laughs> and those will be the six breeder colonies um, each year that we then use to, um, to graft from and to make nukes from. And then we'll, you know, be artificially selecting bees and hopefully improving the, the Northeast stock that Mike's currently um, been doing a fantastic job uh, over the years working on. So that's the two research projects that are um, going to be coming your way in 2021. You can follow us on our on our website. Um, the last thing I'm going to tell you about, which is to me one of the most exciting parts of my job, is the education component and the things that we've been doing um, for, for education. So I'm currently teaching two classes at UVM. Uh, primarily to undergrad students, but the public, our community is, are also invited to join um, and sign up for these classes. They, you know, if you're coming from the community, it could be a little expensive um, for a beekeeping class, um, but you know, students have, get, are getting credit for this anyway. So they, I've been getting a lot of UVM students. And the two classes are Bees and Beekeeping, which is a lecture course taught in the spring, and then an intro to beekeeping in the summer. Um, and uh, so the first time I taught, sorry, I'll back up. The first time I taught intro to beekeeping was in 2019. And it was the first time a beekeeping class had been offered at UVM in over 50 years, which was wild to me, you know, like, like an agricultural <laughs> university. Um, this was, this was really great. And so it was just pretty exciting to sort of set up this curriculum from scratch and, and um, see where it, see where it has gone. And it's been wildly successful. Um, students, love the, the classes always fill up it's a fun class um so we'll first talk about bees and beekeeping this is the the spring lecture course and in 2020 we had 48 students and it was in person until it wasn't and then we had to make the switch to online um because university shut down um and then in 2021 this spring i'm gearing up for it to start for um start teaching again in february and it's going to be all online and we can't excuse me, we currently have 50 students signed up and with a cap of 75. So lots of students, <laughs> thanks, see some clapping. Um, so it's called bees and beekeeping because I love beekeeping, but I also love wild pollinators. So we talk about both. So we start with the beekeeping basics. Um, then we talk about native pollinators, creating pollinator habitat, policy around bees, um, and uh, we also, I, I rope in a bunch of guest speakers, uh, which is great. We had like John Hayden from the Farm Between, who's really 
he's an advocate for creating um, pollinator habitat, wildlife habitat. So he was a guest speaker. Um, it's been, you know, great to get that community input. These pictures are from the last class we had before spring break. Uh, we extracted honey in the classroom. And it was a wonderful way to sort of end our in-person lectures because spring break happened and then the students all had to transition to online. So um, I was, you know, looking at these pictures earlier today and just thinking, like looking at how close everyone's standing and breathing on each other. It's like, like mind boggling that this is even, you know, this was less than a year ago that this was happening, it's wild. Um, but that was that was probably the highlight of the of that class for, for, for students is getting to extract the honey in the classroom. We made a big mess. We put a tarp down and it was fun. Um, so intro to beekeeping, it's a three credit class. And um, first time I taught it in 2019, as I mentioned, was the first time in 50 years we had had a beekeeping class. It was a really small class. We had, I think, 12 students, um, which was perfect for a first time class when you're trying to handle people in an apiary. The apiary is located at the Hort Farm, the UVM Hort Farm, and it's a mix of mostly Chaz Moraz's bees of Champlain Valley apiaries. He actually set up an apiary um, for us, uh, and also to help pollinate the apples there, and their bees are doing really well there, but, um, and so he lets us just do whatever we want. He's like, sure, do, <laughs> you want to graft queens? Go for it, um, which has been, which has been really, really great to, ha to have that resource and, and his um, support with us. So we've got like 48, 40 hives there. Um, so we have a lot of, lot of opportunities for learning. Um, and so 2019 was all in person four week crash course, 2020 was all online. And so there's gonna be some differences between those and I'm gonna explain how we made that transition, but we did, um, so some of the topics we talk about or do um, is beekeeping basics. You know, we did queen grafting, nuke building, identifying and treating for pests and pathogens, we did some hygienic behavior, testing self-led field trips, which I'll tell you about in a second. And then I encouraged everyone, at least in 2019, to attend the, um, the summer VBA meeting, which was pretty cool. We all got into a van and drove <laughs> to the meeting and, and, and went. So. Um, so this is what it looked like in 2019. You see we have a, our small class there, some, some community members as well as um, undergraduate students. Um, these, all these students, most of them had never been around a beehive before. So this was like, you know, first time doing everything, which was pretty exciting. Um, guest speakers, again, we, Chaz Mraz came, of course, and showed him how to not use a veil. <laughs> and, um, you know, talked about his method of walk away nukes and how to, you know, treating with, um, uh, my way quick strips and things like that. Um, this was, let's see if I can. Oh, oops, it's all right. We'll get back to it. <laughs> Not sure what happened there. You're currently looking at my PowerPoint screen, right? Yep. Okay. Can you guys all see that still? Yes. Okay, so this, this video, I don't, for whatever reason, I can't play it, but it's a video of me pouring liquid nitrogen on a frame to do the hygienic test where you kill a section of brood and then you come back the next day and you see how much of the pupae the bees have pulled out and um, you can sort of estimate the level of hygienic behavior that the bees are exhibiting, which is good for, um, for disease or pathogen um, resistance. And... Um, and so we did that with the students. They loved the liquid nitrogen trick. And <laughs> um, so they were estimating, you know, hygienic behavior with the bees. Um, we had the first year in 2019, Mike Willard came and we grafted queens and raised queens. So that's what we're doing there. Um, and then the students all paired up with local beekeepers in the community um, and uh, went on a self-directed field trip to their yards and learned alongside them in like groups two or three. And then they came back to the classroom and did a presentation about what they learned with the beekeepers. And it was so cool like to get them in like, cause it was just me, you know, well, we had some guest speakers, but it was largely learning like how I keep bees, but we all know everyone keep bees, keeps bees differently and has opinions about everything. So it was really cool to get the students like a very diverse, 
um, understanding about there's lots of ways to do the same thing. Um, and then they all shared it with each other, which was really, really cool. So um, in the summer of 2020, it looked a lot different. <laughs> This is what this is what the students. This is how the students learned. I spent um, several weeks in the beginning of the summer putting together. Uh, I, I got a couple of GoPro video cameras and tripods, and made like a ton of videos um, around like how to work through a hive. Um, you know how to do the hygienic testing, how to feed bees. I had a macro lens on my camera so I could get a picture of an egg, which you're viewing um, over here is a little bee egg, which was actually kind of nice because some of these things are so small, they're difficult to see in the field. Um, and so creating all these videos for the online summer course, they're gonna have a lot of use in the future. Um, one thing that, we, that I was able to do is graft queens, um, put them into mating nukes, and, um, and mark them and go through the whole process starting from the larvae all the way to a marked queen at the end. Um, so I have a video about that that the students viewed. Um, and so I've got 49 videos, they're all on YouTube playlists um, for, for UVM students or for the class. And so what we ended up, or what I guess what, what I ended up with was all these marked queens because I because I had done this, gone through this process for the sake of making these videos. And I'm like, I don't have a use for any of these queens. So then I was able to, I gave them out to, um, you know, I posted something on Facebook about, you know, UVM queens that we grafted, come pick them up. And we had a day that people came and, and grabbed the queens for me at the Hort Farm. But I'm envisioning this could be something in the future if we have students who are doing this. Um, they could graph the queens and then we could have a, you know, a big field day where people come and maybe make it into a fundraiser or something, pick up a queen from a UVM student that they grafted. Um, I thought it'd be a really fun kind of activity in the future. So um, this is one of my final slides here. Um, so in the future, um, or no, so other outreach we're doing is we're conducting and publishing interviews with pollinator experts. So you can see those on our, on our website. We have two that we're about to put up pretty soon. Um, the, colony loss slash beekeeper survey in 2021. Um, those, that's another outreach kind of thing. And so please respond to that when you get that. And then we're gonna be working on becoming more of a clearinghouse for these resources and data um, as we build out our website. So how could you get involved with us? Take the survey that you're gonna get <laughs> from VBA or from, uh, from the Bennington Club and um, really think about trying to send in some samples to our diagnostics lab. Um, it would be helping out a, a much bigger cause and also maybe providing you with some, some interesting information. And then of course you can follow us on social media. And yeah, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the whole nine, and that's our website. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Um, Samantha? Yes. Um, is the bee lab operating right now? So we're not uh, we're not accepting samples right now. That's the the di yeah. So the diagnostic clinic part is is currently closed. It will be opening again in um, in March or April. Okay. Yeah, we haven't decided on a set date. Um, if if I was in person there, um, if we were all in person, you would notice that I'm um, six months pregnant. So. <laughs> oh wow. Wow, congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. It's funny because I no one knows because it's, you know, from here up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we're trying to, I'm due in April, so we're trying to figure out how all this is going to happen. Oh <laughs> but we're thinking maybe probably starting, maybe starting the lab opening up in, in late March. and early, uh, It's still kind of early for beekeepers that's that early anyway, but maybe April would be a good idea. <laughs> If, if I have a dead out now, could I freeze the bees and then send them in a couple months, a few months? So um, that's a great question and we get it a lot. The, ideally what we're beginning is bees that you collected when they were live. Um, and the reason for that is because once the bees die, we're not gonna be able to give you accurate Varroa or Nozema loads because it affects the Nozema spores, the Varroa might no longer be on the bees. Um, and so we're not, we're not sort of a diagnostic clinic saying like, this is why your bees died. It's yeah. more of like, they're, they're still alive when you collect them. And that's a great question. Send us bees that you unfortunately stuck in ethanol and killed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And that's a frequently asked question on our page that you can, you can okay. look at. Good to know. Mm -hmm. 
Samantha, it's been fascinating uh, listening to you. I'm particularly uh, very interested in the way you're going to be authentic, you know, getting the honey to be authenticated. Yep. Um, how can we participate in that? That's a great question. Um, so we, we only have, we're kind of limited by the budget because it costs, you know, so much money to get each sample tested. Um, and so we are only, only need 30 samples. Um, and Andrew Munkris early on already identified the 10 beekeepers who are providing samples to us. So we're currently at a point where we need to get samples from the shelves of honey of stores. And my crew have all pretty much already collected all of them. Um, they are, they need a couple more samples from grocery stores that are considered local. Um, they've been sort of looking everywhere. So if I guess, long story short is we kind of already have our samples but if you know of a store that carries a local honey sample um if you wanted to email me the name of it or something that we could go and check out because my student was like i've got all i've gone to all the stores i've collected all the local honey there's nothing left <laughs> so um at that point yeah at this point that's all we can do because we have most of the honey but going forward i'm wondering if this is going to be you know depending on what we find for our results um, this could, I would love to see this expanded because realistically 30 samples is not that many to get like, you know, to really say something about the prevalence of all the honey in the state, it'll be a good start. But I imagine if, if this gets expanded, we'd want to get the, the help of the, um, the clubs. In the future, would you consider taking um, several samples and mixing them together and then sending that out for testing? Um, it's kind of an aggregate of sugar content or of you know, non-honey content in a whole bunch of people's samples. That would, out, uh, that would make you increase your end value with less money. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess it would it would increase, it wouldn't increase our N because it was, it would be, oh, it'd be taking like an N of five and making it an N of one. Um, and yeah, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I guess we, we wouldn't be able to tell, we would be able to say there's adulteration within these five samples, but we don't know to what extent. So I think, yeah, I think we're probably better off sampling honey from specific sources to really get an idea of the prevalence. But I like where you're. I like where you're thinking. I like. I like the idea of saving money. <laughs> you can do a lot just knowing the mean of a high number of samples. Mm -hmm. Yep. Samantha, do you work in tandem with the uh, obviously the registration of apiaries and those statistics that come through? Um, so with the the apiary inspector yes. with the registration. So um, the this, this survey that we put out in 2017, that went out with the apiary registration forms, okay. um, which is why we got like 75% response rates. Um, and that was back when David Tremblay was the apiary inspector. And then after that, it turned out like the agency of ag said, no, you can't be looking at our data. Like this is... <laughs> This, this data can't be leaving our agency. Um, and so they kind of put a stop to us being able to use that way uh, as a conduit for collecting data, okay. um, which was unfortunate. And um, there's been issues with them sharing data with us. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, and I'm, not, I'm not looking for, for, I don't care the names and locations of the beekeepers, they can all be anonymized. I just would like to know, um, you know, like colony loss information. And unfortunately, you know, and, and at, a, at a, the only, the best they could do was provide that at like a county level um, or or not even at a county level. But it, so it's, it's not the scale that we need to do some of these um, statistical analyses, you know, to correlate it with mites or some of these things. So that's one of the reasons why it was becoming, I think it's just the bureaucracy of the state and, you know, trying to, for them trying to do the right thing liability wise with their lawyers that we just decided we're going to send out our own survey because this was like, it took, you know, two years to even come to this conclusion after so much back and forth about data sharing. <laughs> it's really unfortunate, but that's, that's a long story on that. Uh, so at this point, you will be sending out another survey and you'll be doing that through the VBA? That's right, yep, yeah. So the VBA is 
um, we already developed the survey and um, Greg at the VBA is putting it all online. Um, and so that's another thing. With the Agency of Ag Survey in 2017, it all had to be paper. And then we had to enter all that data. So we had like 700 and something surveys, excuse me, to enter. Um, and so this one's gonna be all online and you'll get it through the VBA. Okay, great. It won't just be VBA members. We're gonna try to get it out to any and all beekeepers. So it'll be, you, if, if the club could publicize it to, to your members, that would be great too. And so we can reach out with, you know, each head of president of every club to make sure it gets out to folks. That'd be great. That sounds good. Does yeah. anybody have any other questions for Samantha? If I can add about the survey coming out, that is not just for the VBA members. I believe that is for all beekeepers in Vermont. Right. Join the VBA nonetheless. Yeah, that's true, Jeff. Yep. I see a, a message here in the chat about honey. So um, thank you. For, for writing that out. I will make notes and send it over to Brianna who's been driving all around the state collecting honey. <laughs> well, I don't have a question, but I would like to say it was a great presentation and I really enjoyed it immensely. Oh, thanks Dana, I appreciate that. If you are Dana, unless you're signing into your like Dana. wife's account. <laughs> okay, <Yes>. hi Dana. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate that. No, I found it uh, fascinating, uh, Samantha. Uh, who knew that the Vermont Bee Lab does as much as you do? So uh, I think this is something that we will be keeping an eye on. And certainly uh, I'm going to be encouraging all our members to at least try and send a sample up. And then we'll discuss that probably in our meeting this af uh, after uh, you are finished. And uh, perhaps we can, because you and I had discussed perhaps setting up something like a I think you mentioned a hub where one person down here and the Southern Vermont can collect some samples and get them up north. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I, yep. That's that's what I was thinking, and I, I, you know, I'm open up to, I'm open to suggestions of how you guys might think this would work for your operations. But you know, if if someone does come up this way periodically, or you know, if they'd be willing to meet us part way. Um, maybe they could serve as, as the hub, you know, for the Bennington Bee Club, they could help, you know, they can, we can get our empty sample containers, you know, clean ones to that person, they could help to distribute it to your crew, um, and then get it back and then let me know when I'm, you know, when there's ready, a good time to pick up or drop off and we can coordinate that way, you know, once a month or whatever, um, that's that's sort of what I'm thinking, but I'm, I'm open to, to any, any ideas that you might have that might, ease the, the process in getting samples up to us. Uh, we have a question from Mike. Uh, actually, it's more of a uh, inquiry about any comments on why the Northeast Kingdom has such a hard time for beehives surviving. Do you think it's that, habitat? That's a great. More, more difficult terrain, mountainous? That's a great question. Um, so if you're familiar with um, Noah's climactic climatic regions. Um, so every area of the U.S. is split up into climatic regions based on, you know, you know, where it lies on topography or, you know, just the, the microclimates that might be in that within that region. And Vermont, if I remember, is split up into uh, four climatic regions. Um, and if you were to look at the climatic, the a map of the climatic regions of the state and overlay it on top of the colony loss data, it is incredible that how obvious, like how it's so um, separated by these climatic regions. It's really, it was really bizarre. Um, and we did, you know, the statistical test to found that climatic region was a good predictor of, you know, your colony loss in, in, um, in the state. With the Northeast Kingdom, whatever number, I forget the number of the, that climatic region um, being the highest. And so, I don't know if that's what's driving it, but it's a pattern that we recognized. Um, we, you know, they maybe have harsher winters. Um, you know, we see, you know, more difficult terrain, harsher, harder time be surrounded. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat box. Um, and it might be that, you know, in some cases, bees can do really well when you wrap them nicely. <laughs> um, and so maybe that, you know, education around um, good wrapping protocols for the Northeast Kingdom might help um, 
those bees. I wonder about um, how much activity. I don't really know much about the beekeeping clubs in that region. You pro you guys would probably know more than I would, um, you know, and how much education goes around, you know, through those clubs to out to beekeepers in that area, um, whether that's, a, you know, that's a difference. Another um, thing that was suggested to me was, where those people are buying their bees from, you know, people tend to buy their bees from a place that's near them. And, you know, maybe people in the Champlain Valleys might be getting their bees from, you know, suppliers like, you know, like Mike Palmer or some of the other really reputable suppliers. I don't know where bees in the Northeast, I'm not making any judgments here, but maybe it's, you know, where the bees are coming from, but um, definitely the climatic region um, thing is worth checking out if you hadn't seen that before. Um, and seeing how that overlays with the map was, was really interesting. Thank you, Samantha. Does I see let's, else? I see, let's plan on get on Wyndham County as well in this hub. Let's plan on Wyndham County as well in this hub. Oh, and we're talking about the samples, getting yeah. Wyndham County. Yes. yes, the sample hub. Sample hub, I like it. Yeah, I like <laughs> it. it. Cover yeah. Southern Vermont. Yeah. yeah. And you're the, so I'm planning on reaching out to other clubs, but I hadn't done it yet. But since I was giving this talk um, this week and chatting with Peggy, I was thinking, oh, this might be a good place to start, learn what, figure out what, what's going to work well with you guys. And then I can start reaching out to other clubs. Um, but it'd be great to get your input and help on how to, on how to make this happen. And I, I actually possess several test jars from the farm show last January. And I ended up in your program. So the girls came down and sampled our bees. Oh, that's right. You're Jeff. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> that oh, Jeff. That Jeff. Yeah, I know Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you were part of the National Honeybee Survey. I think you might have. Did you give my girls mead? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I did. <laughs> the ones that were 21 years old. Hey, I know I'm not I'm not saying <laughs> yeah they told me they're like Jeff was really nice he gave us mead they actually brought it up again like two days ago when I met with them they're like was it Jeff who gave us the mead <laughs> well they are coming down to pick up our honey samples and for this uh the, the testing okay. tomorrow finally Brianna and I are finally hooking up there uh that's and just for the record, for everyone else, it's I have a sample going in, and Gene Davis also has a supply to sample. So we have one from Bennington County in that survey. Oh, for the honey. Uh, yes. A yep. pound of honey and a, a pound from Wyndham County. Yep, that's great. Yep, wow. that's right. That's Thanks great. for um, helping me to <laughs> connect the dots here, Jeff. <laughs> Samantha, if I could make a suggestion of. Uh, if the future for the bee lab, I, I think uh, some of the beekeepers in our area might be interested if the lab offered an adulteration testing service mm. um, for so that we knew what the sugar content was um, from for our bees and yeah. not necessarily something that they would put on a label, but just so that we could say, you know, um, Bennington County uh, beekeepers have, I wouldn't say, you know, less sugar than, than Wyndham County or something like that, but just as a comparison. <laughs> no, that's not a challenge, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, that's, that's- But it might be instructional crazy. also to tell you as a beekeeper that you're giving them too much sugar water feed in the spring, or um, you're not giving them enough during dearth or something in, the, in August or something like that. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great point. And I, I don't know the, the, the kinds of testing and, um, you know, the certification that might be required for the lab to be able to get, you know, to the point where we can offer those results and then have, you know, anyone actually believe us um, might be more than, than what we're capable of currently. But what I'm planning to do is put together a resource for, or maybe once we start sending samples out to lab, maybe creating a resource for, um, you know, like other, like opportunities, like, vetted labs that we might have worked with already with information about this is you want to know this this is the lab you want to send to and you know this is what you ask for and this is how much it costs 
um, so that if we're not doing it, we at least we can at least like let you guys know like here's where to send your lab, your your honey to. Um, that might be the first step for us because the the equipment and the protocols and things that we need to do would be kind of a hurdle and cost money. <laughs> well, you could develop a litmus stick and charge for it. Uh, yeah. 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 Start charging. Yeah. Yeah. The the things that happen when you start charging for services at the university. Oh. <laughs> the red tape. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I, I think that sounds, that would be great to get more involved. Just one of the that. general fund anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, someone called you a rapscallion. <laughs> <laughs> well, Samantha, thank you so much for enlightening us. And we are certainly hoping perhaps by the end of the year, we could get an update. And perhaps you and I, we can correspond and, and I can give an update on some of the statistics you come up with, uh, perhaps at the uh, end of fall. fall yeah, that, October meeting. Okay. That, that would be great. Yeah. And um, let me know what comes out of your, um, your meeting or your discussion about being a sample hub. And we'll figure out, we'll figure out what that's going to look like. <laughs> that sounds good. So everyone will say thank you very much to Samantha and we will continue on with our meeting. So thank you, Samantha. Thank you. So much. Hi, thank you everyone. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Samantha. Samantha. Thank you very much, Samantha. Thank you. Okay, I thought that that was excellent and I will be working on some other speakers coming up for April. Uh, I have also talked to the other officers and perhaps we can do an open meeting uh, in March. And it would be a good time for all of us just to have an open discussion, perhaps after uh, we start uh, doing the uh, virtual beekeeping class that uh, Jean is so graciously helping us with. Uh, let's start just first of all by saying this is the uh, first meeting of 2021 and that means dues are due. And as you all know, it's $15 per individual, $20 per family. Uh, the uh, address I sent along in the email, if you need another uh, copy of that, it's to be sent to our treasurer, Mary Ellen. And I don't know uh, what we will do because usually we send out little cards that proclaim that you are a member of the club. Um, We'll have to figure out that. Maybe we'll just hold them until our next meeting because I think it would just cost way too much uh, money to send you a little card. So uh, we will definitely, if you put your email, uh, which I have, but if you put your email on the check, uh, Mary Ellen could also send you an email just to let you know that we um, got that. Uh, uh, I'm going to skip over the future of the Bennington County because uh, I think we have a nice, healthy amount of members tonight. I was really happy about that because I do try to figure out how many people are gonna come to these meetings. Um, and I wasn't getting a response and I'm thinking, oh, what's going on here? I know that it's hard getting together on, on Zoom. It's so much nicer to be in person and it's so much nicer to have a potluck. So um, I'm optimistic. I think that perhaps this is gonna happen perhaps in the next four or five months. I'm not promising that for April, but, or, and certainly not March, but uh, let, let's hold out that we can do a, uh, usually in June we visit a yard and hopefully we can do that in person. And usually in August, we get together for a picnic. So I hope we can do that uh, also. And then by September, we can get together for our potluck uh, meetings again. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jean just for a few seconds, just to talk about the virtual beekeeping class that we're trying to put together uh, for February. It will obviously be a Zoom class. I think that what will happen is we will uh, advertise it on Front uh, Porch Forum. We'll uh, do a public service announcement and we'll see what we can get virtually for a Zoom class. And Jean has already reached out to uh, a few individuals that will be working on this particular class. Jean, do you have anything you would like to add to this? So we're going to, uh, we haven't met as a group yet, but there are five of us. Um, and if 
you're not one of the people who've already said you'd like to participate, please let me know and if you'd like to. But it's going to be um, pretty small. <laughs> I think with Zoom, uh, we don't want to we don't want to stra strain people's attention spans too much. It's hard to pay attention a long time in a Zoom format. So uh, we're talking about a couple of one-hour sessions with discussion afterwards. Um, and so we're going to meet tomorrow night on Zoom to do some actual planning about that. But it would be a very simplified um, class, really talking about the basics or even just the beginning basics. And um, Tony uh, Antonucci, who's one of the people interested in helping do it, is um, is also very connected with uh, Southern Adirondack beekeepers. And he may be able to share with us how they're doing their course, which is also using um, a lot of online resources. So we'll, we'll have more to tell you about after tomorrow, after we do some planning. Thank you, Jean. I'm gonna put the pitch out there one more time that we need to have every member pay their, boo, uh, their dues. Before I hand it over to Jeff, who is going to obviously make his pitch right now for the Vermont uh, Bee Association, which I also uh, wholeheartedly agree we should be a member of. Yes. Jeff, over to you. Hi, uh, I in October have been voted Vice elected vice president of the Vermont Beekeepers Association. And congratulations, Jeff. That's very exciting. Thank, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you Jeff. very much. I have also inherited the mentor program with the Vermont <laughs> Beekeepers Association. Uh, we're trying to iron out some details and get a little more structure with everyone in the state. The bottom line is number one, we need mentors. And I'm seeing a bunch of people here that are qualified to be mentors with the Vermont beekeepers. <laughs> Unfortunately, several of these spaces don't live in Vermont, <laughs> but we need mentors. Uh, if you've been frustrated over the years by not having a mentor, you can help change this. If you wanna help other beekeepers, you can make a difference. If you remember, <laughs> How overwhelming and frustrating it was way back in the beginning, not knowing who to call. You can become a mentor and help make a difference. Uh, we have a really reasonable criteria to become a mentor. There's a pretty good criteria, criteria also for the mentees. Uh, this also applies to mentees for all you new beekeepers or newer beekeepers. Join the VBA, check out the site, check out the mentor program and sign up either way, uh, mentor or mentee. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, uh, join the VBA. There's been lots of education opportunities. We're doing a lot of Zoom meetings there since in the age of COVID, I guess. Uh, it's time to give back. Thank you for your time. Jeff, do you need to be a resident of Vermont to join the Vermont Beekeepers Association? Uh, if you're, if you, we have someone on the border that's willing, that's one of the criteria is the mentors are not here to raise and take care of the mentees bees. The mentees are supposed to travel to the mentors yards to learn. And if you're in that area, I don't think that should be a problem, David. Okay. Uh, no, I was thinking about membership. I mean, I, the mentor thing I could do as well, but oh. just joining the, the group. The membership, Tony, I yeah, think no. we're open, open to everyone. I know Anthony's yeah. a member, uh, right. Aaron Morris, who was one of our former yep. speakers, yep. was a member. Okay, uh, thank you. I also, we have our uh, Vermont Certified Beekeeper Program too, David, that I think you'd be more than eligible to, to get that certification which is a very, very nice patch. <laughs> just like a, just like a, a Boy Scout patch. Or yeah. Scout patch. It's, a, it's a very nice patch. Jean has one. I followed in her footsteps. And I have one. Jeff, I want the tattoo. I'm waiting <laughs> for the tattoo. You, you, have, are, are, you have the patch also, Anthony? 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I like the idea of a tattoo, David. A tattoo. Uh, yeah, I like that. A tramp stamp. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll pay for one, Peggy. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Thanks, Dana. Uh, <laughs> uh, it kind of brings us to the next. Uh, point on the agenda and that is that uh, we talked about it briefly and that is that the Vermont Bee Lab is seeking volunteers. Uh, Jeff and I kind of thought it would be kind of good don't you think Jeff if we just did it for the Southern Vermont and maybe gathered set something up perhaps probably in the late spring and do a sample and send it up there. Well, our spring, at least my spring, is much different than <laughs> your right. spring. That's right. Yeah. Uh, That's true. But yeah, I, I think we could be, you know, a hub between the two of us. You're right there on Route 7. It's not a far shoot up. I think we could rotate throughout the year. But I, th I think it's a good thing. if Advertise we to both our clubs. Right. Okay. And, and also yeah. send samples up there. Yeah. I think it would be... Uh, uh, I thought those statistics were staggering that a lot of people are not testing. <laughs> that, that I, I think that's one good amazing. thing about this club is that they kind of impressed on me very early on how the importance of testing is. So, Well, I think Brooke talked to us and this is part of the 2021 plan for our apiary registration. We have to have a mite mitigation program in place. Uh, I'm not quite sure where Brooke's going to be talking to the Wyndham County beekeepers in March, I believe. I think we're going to be covering that. Uh, there are some changes out there. We're getting caught up statewide, and we're getting a little more recognition in the southern part of the state, which is quite nice, too. Uh, I think wow. they, they so, realized yeah. there was a void down here amongst us. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of that has to do with you, Jeff, so thank you for that. Well, I think it's everyone helping out now. Uh, I, I want to say with the Bennington beekeepers and mentors, uh, I've learned so much from the Bennington beekeepers, county beekeepers, over the years. It was my first club we joined. Uh, I have the list now as the mentor, pro, you know, as, as in the mentor, and it's like those games we played in kids, you know, you have the two lists and matching people up. I'm trying to match up mentors with mentees. And amazingly, Bennington has very, very few mentees signing up for the program. And I wonder if that's because it's been taken care of in-house through the Bennington County Beekeepers. Possible. Or do they just not know we have a mentor program out there? It's but a let's get the possibility of that, which kind of brings me to the next uh, point, and that is the future of our club, and how do we get more members? How do we continue to keep the members we have? Our uh, email list, Aaron, is huge. And how many people are at our meetings? But has this been an issue uh, ongoing with the club? There are lots of people who, um, who are interested but not interested in going to meetings. Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay, I was thinking, yeah. um, I, I just was wondering, you know, I, I know it's because of the pandemic and everything, which kind of really limits us, especially since we're, right. we're an outdoor club, so to speak, and it's hard to uh, really do anything outdoors especially in winter at this point, but even uh, gathering in a, in a large crowd. So I'm, I'm hoping that perhaps we can uh, put our heads together and see what we can do about getting more recognition for the Bennington Beekeepers Club. So the course, tradition, the course traditionally brings in new members, but this year with everything being online, it may not be a year where you bring in as many people. We're not gonna be able to offer as many hands-on experiences. Right. So we're just gonna to have to work our way through that. Right, so I, but I still need people to kind of participate and maybe yeah. come up with some ideas. And uh, why we are here right now, is everybody open to doing a March meeting? Does that sound, you know, something that everybody would like to do? We can oh, talk absolutely. about 
talk about our bees, talk about what's going on. In fact, I'd like to go around right now quickly and just if anybody has anything they would like to say about how they winterize their bees, are they still going? Um, I will say uh, briefly uh, for us, and this is a good opportunity. I have Doreen, she is a new member. She's joining us right now and she's going to be giving a talk. Doreen, it was nice. We're just getting ready to introduce and talk a little bit about our hives right now. But before I do that, let's do one more announcement. And the announcement would be that you are giving a talk about the art of bees. Is that correct? You need to un unmute. You need to unmute. Another site. Here I am. Sorry. Apologies. Yes, that is correct. So Good Doreen morning. is doing a talk called The Art of Bees on it's uh, March 15th, correct? Um, 13th, I think. Oh, the 13th. I think. Okay. So well, just talk a little bit about that, Doreen, uh, and introduce yourself uh, to us. I know you just joined us, but I found it very fascinating that you are doing this talk and well, up. thank you, um, Peggy, for inviting me and, and for your um, welcoming me into the group. Um, I'm uh, in Vermont now full time. Um, I've been coming here most of my life since I was 12 and I'm um, fire displaced from California. I continue to teach um, online at my um, college in Napa. I teach art history. I've been beekeeping in California for about, um, or I have been rather, for about 15 years. I actually have my supers out in the shed now and I'm really looking forward to getting started in spring. Um, I've been tracking um, and compiling um, examples of artists, primarily women artists, um, working with um, bees and their byproducts for about a decade now. Um, and the talk, which will be on the Green Mountain Academy site, and after the talks, um, their pay for classes, you can always access those free um, following um, the talk itself through the Gmail site. Um, will be on the way that artists have utilized uh, again, these byproducts, it won't be more in-depth than um, uh, an exhibition that I've worked on, which uh, focuses more on the ways that those artists have explored the themes of light and dark within the hive and within our vernacular um, concepts about bees. Busy as a bee, that kind of busy, you know, outside world. And the, and the um, as a, almost in the antithesis, um, the kind of dark womb of the hive. So the talk itself will focus on um, examples of artists um, using bees. There's uh, a marvelous artist, she's 84 now in Ontario, Canada, who lets kind of bees go at it on their own. And she presents them in a sense with objects because bees will build around, as we know, negative as well as positive space. They build comb on objects that she presents them with a football helmet, a shoe. Um, she has some beautiful little porcelain objects that they've constructed these um, elaborate additions to. Um, artists working with crocheting around um, dead bees, not killing bees for that purpose, but after the fact as a reference um, to the effects of um, climate change on bees. Um, and artists who have worked with their with their with inserting their faces, their bodies into constructed hives, in this case, uh, uh, a plexiglass rectangle for hours at a time. Um, and uh, looking back, that artist in particular works with the idea of the old Virgil, um, the bull carcass, out of which, of course, maggots, not bees, were arising. Um, so it looks at a variety of periods, um, contemporary as well as historical. And um, that's about as much as I want to take your time for, but. Well, good, Doreen, thank you. Um, and I will put that out in, as an email. Uh, where that's going to be. And I find it fascinating. I know that I will be attending that, Doreen. So thank you for joining us uh, just for this short 
short visit. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have a previously scheduled seven o'clock Thursday, but I hope that I'll have, maybe there's a chance to view the recording or certainly to catch Absolutely. up. Absolutely. It was a very good uh, lecture. Uh, it was like it. I caught the first like seven minutes. And it was interesting. It, I will be sending a link to everyone on that. So right. let's go around right now and just briefly say how their hives are doing. If they've taken a look, I'll say real quickly. Uh, Dan and I went for a walk a couple of days ago. It's been so cold, we obviously haven't opened up, but there are a lot of uh, bees in the bottom board, right, Dana? And he just uh, just quickly took some of the bees out and there were so many dead bees. We were just like, I was a little freaked by it. Oh. And we thought that one was gone. And then I turned around and there a bee flew out and then another bee flew out. So I think uh, we might get that one through. What do you think, Dana? I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was a good surprise to see some flying. Jean, how about you? Um, I've lost four hives since October. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and and I've got six hives that have live bees. I have gone inside and looked, and I've put sugar cakes in, and I've insulated my hives this winter with uh, rigid foam insulation around the outside and insulation on the top. And none of the four that died, died because of condensation or because of loss of food. So I think it's Varroa, um, but it's also Varroa because we had a really challenging summer and my bees didn't put very much honey by. The, the flowers all here had very low nectar and pollen quality and amounts. So in August, I started feeding. Um, and in August, I fed honey back that I had extracted back into the hive. And then in September, I fed sugar syrup. Um, and I treated for mites in September. And I didn't do oxalic and in November. I couldn't find the right time to do it. Um, and the bee labs are closed, so I couldn't send dead bees. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just keeping an eye on the ones that I've got and uh, crossing my fingers that I don't lose them all. So that's me, sorry. <laughs> it's not very cheerful. <laughs> How many more hives do you have? I have six more. Six more? Yeah. That's encouraging, I hope. I hope so. We'll see. We'll see. A couple of them look like they're they're really tiny, so we'll see. Anybody else? I guess my question would be how how are people checking on their hives? I mean, it's I've always found that to be difficult. You don't want to open them up on a cold, even a forty degree day, you know. And if we get a sixty degree, maybe that would be a chance. But I'm just wondering how other people might consider checking on them to see what kind of condition they're in. You know, one thing you can do is just put your head right up against the side, get, uh, your, yeah. ear, get your ear flat there, yeah. and, you can, and you can hear if there's any any activity going on. And a, a dead hive sounds totally different. Um, or you can peek in the top. Peek in the top, the insulation. Gosh, I so wondered about things like that coming from California. I mean, Northern, but you know. It's different here. You don't even get frost, so I, yeah, that's so helpful, instructional. Just look for the yellow dots in the snow. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. There well, is that's that. to warm up, though. They don't come out unless it's a little warm. That's right. That's true. That's not cold. Jeff, how are yours doing? We saw some of those yellow dots in the snow today. Yesterday, I randomly took the covers off of some of the hives in the yard, one at a time, not all together. Uh, you can lift up the cover and put your ear, and you can even look down into the opening in your inner cover. Put your ear up to that hole, and you can quite often hear the bees in there. Oh, good. Uh, I've lost three hives confirmed here in the yard, uh, in this yard, which our mite numbers were pretty good. This yard was sampled by the Vermont Bee Lab. They came down and took samples and I have to pull out my data and see what the results were. I had nozema in one or two hives. 
the numbers were still low, but it was it was present enough to be tested. I need to check and see if that was the issue in either of those two hives. But like I said, this was just yesterday, and we had a B meeting last night. These Zoom meetings are taking over our lives. Yes, People, right. There is so much information out there beekeeping-wise. Yeah. Next week, I have a scheduled meeting with the New York State Bee Wellness. Is that it, Tony? Yeah, uh, Med Hat Nat Nasser is, is going to talk on. Oh, he's great. Night. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just in that, fact, that, I saw a video of the last time he spoke, uh, talked uh, at New York Bee Wellness, and Gene was in there asking questions. It was the <laughs> summer. It was a summer meeting that she had gone to, I guess. Right, Gene? It was, and Aaron Morris was there too. Yep. Aaron and and whatnot, and. I heard Gene from from afar in the in the meeting and stuff. The one good thing that's come from the COVID is I've been taking setting in in classes at Penn State and Cornell and just it's it's there's so much out there it's really nice. You want more? I got I got tons. Well, we need uh, to talk. We need to. We, I need to pick up the phone and call you or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I just found uh, after the meeting you had Monday night that I sat in on? Yes. Uh, M University of Mer Maryland Bee Club is not is offering, and they offered the first one tonight, uh, talks by every major manufacturer of miticides. Wow. So tonight, uh, Veda Pharma talked about Apivar and Apivar Light, and... Uh, then they're going to have somebody talk about Mite Away Quick Strips, uh, HopGuard, and uh, they're, they're really interesting talks. I mean, they can get mm -hmm. detailed sometimes, but it gives you a chance to understand how the product works, how you're supposed to use it, <laughs> and, and, and what. So there, there are those series of talks. Uh, I can provide, you know, information on on the link to find out about them. And I've been going through Eventbrite, which I guess is like, it, I don't know if it was created because of Zoom, but. Oh, it's good, it's been around a while. I've been watching a lot of talks from England, uh, from bee clubs in England. And uh, they just had, and, and the interesting thing about bee talks from England is for them, they start at seven at night. For us, they're two in the afternoon. So uh, it works out well I, for me. Uh, uh, but uh, I just said, you know, Jamie Ellis from the University of Florida. They get a lot, of, a lot of people from the U.S. to talk, but they also get people from elsewhere in the world to talk. So they've been exceptional. Tom Seeley's going to talk for them. Uh, Dave Tarpey, who talks a lot about Queens. So there, I mean, there's just tons of talks out there, like uh, Jeff has said, and uh, I find it fascinating. It just, uh, and a lot of times they record them. So, you know, if you get in their flow, uh, they'll give you, you know, they'll send you the notice of the link for just the recording if, if you can't sit and walk, you know, through the original one. What's That's the organization? One. Pardon? What's the organization that Eventbrite is hosting for the talk? Well, Eventbrite is some platform. It's a host, but what's yeah. the actual organization? But the organizations are uh, oh, Cambridge Shire Beekeepers, the Somerset Beekeepers, other beekeeping groups all over. Uh, hmm. There's U.S. Uh, clubs that are go go through that platform. Right. Eventbrite controls the registration. Yeah. Right, right. They're the host. And so on. But yeah. they That's once right. you get involved in them, they will send you notices right. that right. will say if this may be of an interest. It's like an algorithm. Yeah. 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 So it's it's really it's, uh, yeah. it's to me it's great. I mean uh, I've I've watched like Jeff uh, every night of the week I have something I can pretty much watch and 
Well, that's uh, great to know, Tony, uh, because I'd love to see if I can find that uh, recording of the apple bar strips. Yeah, uh, they'll. I'm sure they'll send it to me, but uh, I'll I'll get, I'll send you the link uh, for the the University of American uh, Maryland Bee Club uh, with the ad for that uh, those different talks, and if you're interested in in listening. Uh, they allow questions and, wow. you know, as well. So it's, it's really a That's good, good uh, thing. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm trying to keep these meetings brief and not too wordy. So we have <laughs> too exhausted. Uh, again, I want to say thank you to Samantha. I know she's not here, but I thought she did a very good talk. Did. And uh, I know that I do have someone lined up for our October talk, guy named Jeff that's into bees. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Jeff, that'll be good. We can talk about that. And I'm still looking for a speaker for September. So if anybody has any suggestions, I was almost thinking that if I could uh, get a hold of Mike Palmer and get some of his uh, research that he's been doing, that would be pretty awesome. Does anybody else have anything to say before uh, we close our meeting officially? If you can hang on after the meeting, I'll talk with you for a few more minutes about a couple of things, Peggy. That sounds fine, Jeff. It'd be happy it's to. It's really nice to see everyone. It's very yeah. nice to see everyone. Yeah, good to see uh, everybody. I will be sending out uh, emails on the course that we will be doing virtually. And I would invite anybody who is available to be part of that, Gene. What do you think? We can discuss that more tomorrow night. Sure. Might be too much, but uh, if anybody can offer, it's always nice to put things out there as experienced beekeepers to the newbies. So, so I will be sending that out. Uh, I will also be sending an invite uh, for a March meeting for an open discussion. So come with questions and ideas. And again, I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you, hey, Peggy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.